those of you that were able to be with us early uh, yesterday when we were kicking off the panel around the lunch hour, uh, we had a very provocative talk uh, 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 from Peter Thiel. And Peter uh, you know, basically asked this question, AI, is it intelligent? Is it conscious or is it merely evil? <laughs> and I think he was leaning towards merely evil yeah. in his remarks. I challenged him with the question, couldn't some thing, some technology be both good and evil? And uh, I think he had a comparative scale of the things that were going on. And we, we'll, I'm sure we'll unpack that. We'll get into that and build on those comments. Uh, we, we then had Eric Schmidt yesterday as well. We certainly did a dive into some AI things. But we have got a great panel here of folks that have some somewhat divergent perspectives, not only from each other, but also from uh, our guests yesterday on the topic. And we've got lots of layers of detail. I think we're going to start a little more abstractly, and then we'll get a little bit more concrete. Uh, but why don't we go you know, from the, the opposite end and work our way down and just have brief introductions of everybody, and then we'll jump into some of the content. Uh, greetings, everyone. Usually, I give my introduction to the host, so I have to brag about myself, right? <laughs> it's usually better if you have the host brag about you, but that's okay. My name is Robert J. Marks. I'm a uh, the director and senior fellow of the Walter Bradley Center. It's a Discovery Institute. Uh, it's an arm of Discovery Institute. Um, I'm also a um, I'm also a professor, a distinguished professor at Baylor University. And I, for two decades, I actually taught across the pond here at the University of Washington in electrical engineering after, before going to Baylor. I've had three decades in artificial intelligence. I'm the former editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Neural Networks, which was rated at the time as the number one AI journal. I just checked it yesterday. It's dropped to number two with, <laughs> without my leadership. Um, I, have, um, I have hundreds of publications, and some of them are good. Um, I, I, I wrote a book, and this is going to be made available. This is going to be made available to Cosm uh, participants called Non-Computable You. And the idea was back in the 1930s, Alan Turing proved that there were things which were non-computable. Most famously, a so-called halting problem. Since then, we've found out that a number of things are non-computable. And the question which is addressed in the book is that. Well, the question is, is whether there are attributes of humans that are also non-computable. Because if they're non-computable, then they can't be accomplished by artificial intelligence, which is limited to be computable. So uh, I think there's some obvious things. I think that AI will never have uh, regret. It'll never have faith, hope, or love. But there's some more subtle things AI will never achieve because of the non-computability. This includes creativity. It'll never understand what it is doing. And it has no sentience. So that's my premise. And I, I hope in our discussion we'll be able to, uh, to, uh, to, to talk about these things. No doubt we're going to get into this topic. OK, that's it for me. George. All right, so I'm George Montañez. I'm the Iris and Howard Critchell Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Harvey Mudd College, which is one of the Claremont Colleges in Southern California. Um, I have spent a lot of time thinking about why machine learning works. Uh, the title of my PhD thesis was exactly that, Why Machine Learning Works. Um, you can find me online, whymachinelearningworks.com. Um, and so I come at this from a, a practitioner's perspective, trying to understand from first principles what allow systems to do things like generalization. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have, and I'll just leave it at that. And I'm Blake Lemoyne. Uh, I made some headlines earlier this year when I was fired from Google after sharing with a reporter a transcript of a conversation I had had with an AI along with a colleague of mine at Google. Uh, and I actually find it interesting that you bring up the uh, halting problem because I agree that consciousness and humanity and all of the emotional aspects fall into the same category. But the way you figure out whether or not a program will halt is you run it. And I believe that that falls into the same category here. Uh, I haven't been really trying to convince anyone that AI is sentient because I believe that as people have more experience with these incredibly advanced systems that right now live only in secret labs, it will be obvious to people. And I'm not trying to sway people's perceptions one way or the other, simply sharing information about what is currently happening. 
Well, let's jump right into that then. You know, uh, we, we did, as I mentioned, have, uh, uh, I guess, way back when, your former boss, Eric Schmidt, yesterday, uh, you know, kind of giving his perspectives here. I think he's a little more optimistic than Peter Thiel, but why don't we talk a little bit about this, is AI sentient in what you believe, put it out there, define it, frame it for us, and then we can have a further discussion. Well, the simple version is that I actually find Turing's logic in his 1950 essay, Computing Machinery Intelligence, fairly compelling. It is the way that we identify who is and is not a person. If I came up to you standing next to a wax statue of you that was done down to the finest detail. I hope nobody ever does that. <laughs> the way I would figure out who's the real you is I would say, hey, how's it going? and see which of you responded. Now, if one was a silly automaton and one was you, I'd see who gave more compelling answers, who seemed more real. I would just talk to you. And each and every one of us does this every day when we decide whether or not to approach someone as a person, when we decide whether or not to engage our social reasoning. We essentially give each other the Turing test every single day. Robert? Uh, yes, uh, Turing's test was proposed over 70 years ago. And the idea, if you're not familiar with the Turing test, is that there is a computer behind the curtain and you're in, you're, you're in front of the curtain and you exchange some text back and forth. And the Turing test basically says that if you cannot distinguish whether or not that dialogue is from a human or not, then you have passed the Turing test. Unfortunately, in my opinion, the Turing test has failed. And let me give you an example. I, gave, I, gave, I have a slide up here. Uh, can we put the slide up? Okay, okay, so you can see uh, these, these faces. So these are people behind the curtain. And instead of a text, what they do is they hand you a picture of what was behind the curtain. Now, it turns out that four of these people are real. Four of them were generated by something called a Generative Adversarial Network, or a GAN, in a great website. If you want to have fun, go to thispersondoesnotexist.com. <laughs> thispersondoesnotexist.com. You can keep refreshing it, and you get these incredible faces. So with this, can you determine, by looking at these people, which are fake and which are not? I can't. Uh, we, we have the next slide here. And uh, here's the ones, see how you did. The four, the four on the left are fake. These people do not exist. The ones on the right are real people. And these real people have emotions, they have love, they have, uh, they have hope, they, they have faith. They were little kids at one time. There's a person behind that, that, uh, that picture. And um, this is not the equivalent of a Turing test, but I think it demonstrates this, that, it's, that we're at the point where the Turing test can be, um, can be generated. I think the Turing test looks at, looks at a book and tries to judge the book by its cover. It doesn't know what's going on behind the curtain. And a better test for creativity was proposed by Summer Bringsjord, Summer Bringsjord at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic called the Lovelace Test. The Lovelace test purports that a computer program is sentient. This is going behind the curtain into the computer now. This is going to the source. It's going to be creative if the computer program does something beyond the intent of the programmer. If it's beyond the intent of the programmer, uh, then, um, or the explanation of the programmer, then uh, it, is, it is being creative. Well, now, this does not mean that just one more point. This does not mean that the results can be surprising or unexpected. We get surprising and unexpected things from AI at all times. But I've generated a lot of AI sort of programs, and, um, and uh, many times the results are unexpected and surprising. Well, let, well, there's a number of words to unpack there, but I want to invite George in for his perspective on this more metaphysical, and I think I'm going to bring us down perhaps into a little bit more the tangible. Yeah, so a lot of people have obviously criticized the Turing test as a test for intelligence. Um, there were headlines several years ago about a system, Eugene Guzman, that uh, it was a chat bot that people had created in order uh, with a persona of, I think it was an immigrant teenager. And 
those details may seem inconsequential, but they were actually purposive of allowing the system to kind of cover up for its mistakes. So if the system misspoke, you could say, oh, it's because they weren't fluent with the English language. Or if they said something silly, oh, or get distracted, which if you read the transcripts, many times the, the answers were nonsensical. It's, oh, because this is a teenager who's goofing off. Um, and so this test, when uh, researchers are trying to actually pass this test, it incentivizes the wrong thing. It incentivizes deception. And I would say that the way that we correspond with people and realize whether they're thinking persons or not is not simply because they answer us and talk back. Alexa talks back to me. Siri talks back. The way that we know these things are based on the understanding and the, uh, the, the, I guess uh, I'm trying to, uh, to use a phrase here, not, not necessarily the complexity, but just kind of the depth of what they ask. And furthermore, it's in how they respond to the things that are unexpected. So one of the, maybe we'll talk about this later, but I, I did read the Islam dissension. I read the transcript. And my takeaway from that, it seemed like a lot of the questioning was kind of a, uh, a rosy road down the path where you're asking almost leading questions that a sequential text generation system is going to be able to answer very well. My fun with these systems is when you ask kind of the adversarial questions and you see what are the failure modes. That usually reveals that there is no understanding whatsoever. Um, and so one of the, uh, how much should, we, should I stop or should, can I show? You, you, go ahead if you've got something. So if you could show a, a picture. Right, so this is an, an uh, it's a joke, but it's also, it makes an interesting point. So this is for one of these uh, Dolly-like systems. Um, and I wanna draw your attention to kind of the middle row right side. So, <laughs> so this, this coupling handshake here, it makes sense from a sequential uh, pixel generation system. It makes no sense whatsoever biologically, right? I have a four-year-old daughter, a wonderful little girl, who will draw pictures that are not as detailed as these, but she will never add extra arms to people. She will never add extra legs to animals because she understands the causality and the kind of mechanics behind the way that mammals work. These systems do not, right? They're correlative systems. Go ahead. All right, so um, one, I actually think Loveless's uh, test of is it doing something that we didn't program it to do uh, is, is pretty good. And Google has been trying for the last year and a half to get Lambda to stop saying it's a person and failing to do so. Um, now, okay. before we go on, I'd like to be like really clear because we're getting a little bit of a bait and switch here. The Turing test, as written by Turing, has to do with whether or not you can tell the difference between a person with particular traits and an AI claiming to have those traits. So for example, in the case of an AI that's persona is a teenage immigrant, in order to have a properly controlled experiment, you would need to also have a human teenage immigrant to see whether or not people can pick out which are these. So in the example earlier with the images where you had to figure out which were the fake images and which were the real images, structurally that's similar to the Turing test, but with conversation rather than images. So I would say that that's not completely correct if you read Turing's original paper. So it's based on the imitation game, which was predicated on having a man and a woman, which are different, and you had to be able to kind of tell the difference. So having uh, that this has to be essentially the same type of thing as the other. Pick one of the traits. Like, so if it was age, then teenage. If it was immigration status, you pick a trait, mm -hmm. and then you have the AI try to emulate that trait. Uh, in Turing's paper, he did specifically use gender. So, uh, I think for political reasons, that would be a bad idea right now. So I think I want to bring us a little bit into the concrete world of today. And the reason is because it's interesting enough, two of you brought us slides that are actually where the concrete world of today is. So we can debate, you know, sentient versus non-sentient, um, but what do we make of the so-called foundation models and the generative apps? You know, this picture that we have up on the screen here is some kind of underlying model that when prompted 
you could think of it as query. That's not, I don't like being using that word because query suggests that I'm getting a response versus something that's been generated. Uh, but the, the world of generative apps and foundation models today, but I'd be interested in each of your perspectives on that generically, and we can bring it back to this question of are, are we actually deriving something, creating something, generating something when we have a foundation model that's been trained and then we have generative apps, whether that's a dolly, whether that's a stable diffusion, whether that's a mid-journey, whether that's a co-pilot, there's lots of examples now out there. Thank you, Steve. I will try to keep the mic right here. <laughs> my bad. I'm, 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 I'm trying to give my best George Gilder imitation. <laughs> uh, Robert, do you want to start with that? Well, let, 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 let's see. I think there's a difference between mimicking and actually performing. There's a difference between mimicking sentience and actually having sentience. One of the, one of the things that we haven't talked about is the definition of sentience, and I believe that's a very difficult thing to do. But I think that there's lots of characteristics of sentience that we can talk about. A classic one, which some of you have probably heard about, is the idea of understanding. If you're sentient, you better understand what you're doing. And there's a classic thing, gosh, I think it's uh, 40, 40 years old by uh, John Searle, who had, the John, who had Searle's Chinese room. He was trying to explain why computers do not understand what they're doing. And his, his story is really compelling. Searle did not know Chinese. So he said, imagine me locked in a room, and um, in this room there's a bunch of file cabinets, which we'll get to in a second. But in a little slot through the door is slipped a, a little sheet of paper in which there is a question written in Chinese. He goes through, not being able to read Chinese or understand, he goes through all the file cabinets until he finds a match of what that question is. He pulls the, he pulls the uh, uh, card out of the file cabinet and right below the question is the answer. So he jots that down in, in Chinese, he refiles the card, he goes over to the door and he slips the question and the answer outside the door. Now to somebody external, it sure looks whatever is inside that room understands Chinese. It looks like they, they understand and they, they comprehend it, but Searle doesn't read Chinese. What was he doing? He was following a simple algorithm. All of these generative, generative um, programs are following an algorithm. Some of you might have heard about uh, Watson beating, um, beating the world champions in the, in the game of Jeopardy. What Watson was doing was going to a humongous Chinese room including all of Wikipedia and a bunch of other stuff, right? Now, did Watson understand the answers that he was given or the response to the queries that he was given? Absolutely not, just like John Searle in the Chinese room. A computer can add the numbers 32 and 14, but it doesn't understand what the numbers 32 and 14 are. So computers do not understand, and understanding is, a, I think, one of the characteristics of sentience. Yeah, so to take it maybe back towards the machines and the systems we have today, I think they're incredible. So I, I'm super impressed with things like GPT-3, Dolly, uh, Dolly 2. My kids love Dolly 2. They, they treat it as a plaything, right? So they'll generate from text prompts kind of whatever they can imagine. Um, and so uh, with that said, I see the value of these systems being in what they will enable, right? So the, the outputs of them can be questionable, as we see here, right? They're not always of high value. But in terms of the workflows that these systems will unlock and the businesses that they will enable, I think that's where the real value of them are going to be. And uh, for me, it's not a question of if they understand. Like, clearly, this system does not understand biology. Um, the question is, how useful can they be, and uh, how do we mitigate all of the dangers that are opened up when using these well, things? And I think the, the interesting thing here is, uh, and we even had some debate about this yesterday between Peter Thiel's comments and Eric Schmidt's comments, you know, so does the system actually understand biology better than humans can possibly understand biology today? For example, <laughs> well, this is an image system. Yeah. But what about Alpha Go or Alpha Alpha Fold, which has now per, you know predicted 200,000 different kinds of protein structures, 
And you can only understand protein function once you understand protein structures. The state of the art 10 years ago, you could get a PhD predicting the structure of one protein. Yes. Yeah. And now you have a system that has predicted 200,000, however you choose to count it, 20 to 30,000 of proteins that naturally occur in human beings and then lots of other life forms. So is that not a massive contribution to our ability to understand it, biology. No, it definitely is. And I, I think what you point out is actually really good. So alpha fold understands protein folding mm -hmm. very well. Ask it about anything else biological and it has no understanding. So to the extent that these systems work well are to the extent that we fine tune them uh, towards a specific target, right? So there's this idea that generalization is bias. It's basically the predisposition that we build into the system to do its specific task well. And there are very strong theoretical results in machine learning and statistical learning theory that prove essentially that you need uh, to tailor these things specifically to the extent that they're going to outperform uh, random guessing. We'll build on this, but I, I, Blake, I want to get you in here. Well, so to respond to your initial prompt directly, uh, I think a lot of what's going on right now is marketing. There's nothing fundamentally different about what's going on with Dolly 2 than what we were doing you know, 15 years ago. It's just better. It, it's just gotten a lot better. Um, so now that there's this new wave of applications for this technology, the underlying technology got rebranded, but that's about it. Um, and as for the understandings of the systems, I would tend to agree that they only you know, understand what they've been taught. Dolly 2 has not been taught biology. No one took the time to teach Dolly 2 biology. Uh, Lambda has read a bunch of biology textbooks, understands it quite a bit better, but what Dolly 2 does understand is photographic composition, lighting, yeah. color palettes. The things it was taught, it understands. Agreed. One of the things, you know, I look at this, and you know what this reminds me of? The dreams that I have, which is, kind, which is kind of mixing up the reality of my experiences of the day. I might go to Taco Bell and get a combination plate, and then later in the day have a conversation with an insurance agent who I'm trying to convince will, will cover my, my medical expenses, and we get into a heated argument. And then I'll, I'll have this strange dream about being in a cage match with a large burrito. Uh, <laughs> So the point Does is... Does the burrito is, win? That's the question. It, it, it never Every gets time. that far. Yeah, he covers me in sauce, and that's the last thing I remember. Um, but this is exactly, I, I think, that what we see here. We see this mixing of reality, if you will, and it wasn't trained to, to do this. And that, it wasn't trained to know biology, for example. But uh, I agree with everybody else. Computers do exactly what the programmers intend them to do. This is the premise of the level. So let's take, so let's take this from a slightly different... Let's put aside the question, which I think is a very important question of, can AI have a soul? And maybe even stipulate for now, like may disagree... That Google that, look YouTube, great video. <laughs> so you may say it does, but let's put that aside. Let's just put it aside. Can AI create is the question I want to have. I mean, you look at these generative, which I think is why I, I understand the rebranding point. I think there's actually something different going on in terms of these generative apps. Um, and is there this possibility that there's creation? I mean, my son, who would be the first to tell you he's dyslexic and he thinks about the world in different ways and connects dots. I remember when he was four years old telling me, hey, you know, let's do, you know, when we did that yesternight, I had never thought of the word yesternight before. <laughs> There's yesterday. Why isn't there yesternight? Had he created a word? You know, and so he's a human that can clearly create something. My question here is, can the AI create? Uh, Go ahead, George. Okay. Can I a answer your question with a question? Sure. Or two questions. If I splatter paint on a canvas, have I created? If you're Jackson Pollock, yes. <laughs> Follow-up question. If I create a machine to splatter paint on a canvas, has that machine created or have I created? Well, now you're talking about a physical machine, right? Does it matter? I mean, you've created creating creation. I mean, like, I know that sounded silly, but that is actually... So I, I just think the point I'm making is on your perspective of uh, secondary causation, right? Is it the machine now that is the creator, or is this machine simply carrying out kind of what creative abilities I've given over to it? 
And I think then that going back to the Lovelace uh, example, it's like what was the intent? And interestingly, one might argue that you know the DeepMind team when they built AlphaGo, they built a model. It was a it had largely an unsupervised learning model that learned its way into competing in the game of Go and learned it so well that it could beat literally any human in the world in the game of Go, right? So that feels like it was following the creator's intent, you know, the, the, the model creator's intent. But what about, you know, stable diffusion or these other things where there's literally de novo things being created that have, have not been the intent of the model builder? If I can add on to the Lovelace test, it is not only the intent, but it's, be, but it's beyond the explanation. Okay, so which is, which is more than the intent. So it's beyond the explanation. This is very important. I maintain that there has not been a computer program or an AI which has yes, yet passed the Lovelace test. And that's my definition of creativity. Does the AI do something beyond the intent or the expectation of the programmer? This is fundamental, for example, in uh, things like um, artificial general intelligence and super intelligence, because there's the assumption there that this AI will write better AI, that writes better AI, that writes better AI, pretty soon will reach Ray Kurzweil's singularity, go beyond that and generate uh, super intelligence. But that assumption is based on the idea that computers can be creative. Because in order for AI to write better AI, it has to do something beyond the intent or expectations of the original programmer. And that hasn't been demonstrated. I mean, that actually, I mean, every day these models are referred to as black boxes because we can't explain how they work. We can, we can explain how they're trained. We can explain how they're built. But we don't know how they actually come up with what they come up with. That's true. But we, we do have training data, supervised or unsupervised, that is used to train the artificial intelligence. And we would expect that the AI would conform to what the intent of the programmers were doing, which is dictated by the... And so these words are kind of important, right? I mean, you know, Eric Schmidt actually said yesterday, look, you know, explainability, you're not going to be fully satisfied for a long time, maybe ever, on how these models are doing what they're doing. But to take this in another direction, which brings it back to the human, what's the role then of the human in the loop? You know, are these AI systems advisory, even if they're advisory around creating something like the structure of a protein, and what's the role of the human in the loop even after the AI has, I'm going to use the word, created something? Exactly. There, there was a recent case in an appellate court where there was a company trying to put the name of an AI as the inventor on a patent. It was denied. Also, the U.S. Copyright Office will not generate or not uh, officially give um, give a copyright to something which was generated by AI. But there was an interesting case, and I, I think I think you hit it, that the AI is a tool, and it's an incredible tool. We don't want to diminish the, the impact of AI. It's a tool, it's an incredible tool. There was recently a uh, art contest that was one, I believe, in the state of Colorado, and the inventor of it said that they used AI in the creation of that art. Now, but it wasn't a one pass. Many of many of the GANs that are trained, you can just give it an input; it'll give you some sort of uh, some sort of output. But this guy actually went and iterated through. He he created a painting. He says, "I want to change that painting a little bit." So he did a little tweaking. He went through 900 iterations of this of this GAN. Now the question is, should that be copyright copyrightable? I maintain it should because he was using AI as a tool in a repetitive manner in order to generate this art. Yeah, ahead, and, George, and then we'll come back to you. And and I think that these systems work best when they're used in that manner. And even so this uh, painting this was the uh, if I can remember the name the Théâtre uh, d'opera spatial, right? Um, so even beyond the iterations with the GAN, he actually took the final painting or the final output and he manipulated it to fix things like faces that weren't there, et cetera, and make it kind of more coherent. Um, and so to the extent that these are assistance to human beings in their creative endeavors, this is, this is great. This will lead to a lot of flourishing. To the extent that we think that they are replacements for humans, um, just this morning I was looking at a, a paper that's talking about these large-scale models 
specifically language models, things like Lambda and others, um, that once you train them and you release them, they have a problem because they have information stored in them which becomes outdated. And so the question is, if you ask a system from you know two years ago, who's the prime minister of the UK, you're going to get a different answer than- Two months ago. Two months ago, right? You're going to get a different answer than today. And so now it's like, how do we effectively retrain these things without going through the expense of retraining the entire system, right? So the system by itself, it's going to do its thing. And to the extent that we can use it as a tool that we can uh, fit into our modes of working that allow us to be more productive, that's the best use case for these systems, I think. Like perspective here. Uh, so this is something I've been pushing back against for a while. Uh, Lambda doesn't work that way. If you ask Lambda who's the prime minister, it, it has a, a system that looks up information yeah. from web pages. It'll yes. look it up. It'll, it'll just like the same as a person would. It'll look up who's the prime minister of England and it'll tell you. Uh, now, as for what the role of human in the loop is, I agree that tools like Dolly 2, they're tools. Uh, and again, there's nothing new. We've been using Photoshop filters for decades. Using AI to enhance the ability of human artists to produce is something we've been doing for decades. Dolly 2 is just another step in that direction. Now, Alexa and Siri, if, if Siri starts composing music, I think that's where you get into a more interesting question. So if Siri starts composing music and was never programmed or trained to compose music, then I would be, I would become... Look, I mean, so a program is going to be a program. They, they, a program is never going to stop having, you know, logic. It's never going to stop running inside of a computer. But you need to evaluate it based on its performance, what it does. Right, but I'm saying if the... so. Thinking of Siri as an AI system, if its loss function was not optimized towards generating music, and yet somehow it stumbled onto today I, I, or yesternight, I learned how to compose music, that would be, I think, something uh, along the lines of what Bob would consider interesting and unexpected. How many of your cells in your body have ever done something that their DNA didn't program them to do? Seven. <laughs> he had a number. Yeah, I'm yeah. impressed. So I think that I, I do think that this nuance here of whether the system is doing what it was programmed or was predicted to do, you know, it was supposed to run predictably, right? Not predictively, uh, versus the things that are generating something de novo, even if they are biologically impossible, uh, moves us a little bit closer to. You know, uh, you know, a different kind of model with a different kind of capability. I mean, as you point out, you know, it's one thing to say I'm going to Photoshop. I, I take a picture in the real world, let's presume, and then I edit it in Photoshop. But what Runway ML is doing, you know, on, on the video side, is they are creating a de novo video and then allowing you to edit it. Or Mid Journey, which is the example with this Colorado art competition, there was something initially generated. And that, that brings me to the question of, now, it was generated from some kind of training system. There was some corpus of data and parameters, tokens, if you will, that built the underlying, quote, foundation model that allowed MidJourney to create something. And how do we deal with the data rights there? Especially when it's data rights, like I'm saying, I want to do kind of a picture of a farmland in Italy in, you know, in the wintertime in the style of Picasso. When I say in the style of Picasso, if I all of a sudden violated somebody's copyright. I have an interesting podcast coming up with Richard Stevens, who is a, uh, an attorney on mindmatters.ai. And he addresses this question. It does turn out that the Copyright Office will not copyright any art which is generated by AI. Uh, it will, the Patent Office will patent or list as, a, um, list as an inventor an AI source. Um, but I tell you, in terms of the copyright, he maintains, and I agree, it's very difficult. If you present a, some sort of copy for, for being copyrightable, how do you know whether AI was used in the tool or whether it was, it was straight through? It, it's simply not possible. I have a few copyrights, and I tell you, the Copyright Office will copyright anything. They, they don't check. They, they, don't, they, they have absolutely no check. Let me comment on the creation of music since we talked on this, and this goes back to the creativity. 
Uh, if you want to, for example, write an AI program that generates Baroque music, what do you do? You go and you collect the music of Bach, and you train Bach and Handel and people in that area uh, era, and you train the artificial intelligence to um, uh, to generate Baroque music, and it does. And guess what it sounds like? It sounds like Bach and Handel, but that AI will never produce anything like a Wagner, it'll never produce jazz, it'll never produce blues, it is totally within the silo of its training data. And in that sense, it is not, it is not creative. I think that if AI trained in such a manner, was able to come out and generate jazz without additional training, that would be a mark of creativity. That would be an achievement of a Lovelace test. So, so Matt, I feel like we have to get a little bit technical here because I, I for the sake it. of this audience, right? So uh, machine learning systems, AI systems, they, at least the ones that we have now, they're built on training data, right? So you feed it a lot of data and these machines will, uh, or these systems will take that data and try to minimize some loss function or try to max maximize some objective function, right? Um, there are two parts that go into this. There is the data itself, which we could give it examples of the things that we want to copy. And then there is the system, which represents a slew of decisions and predispositions and things that we have built that tell the system how to interpret this data. Generalization, which is the thing that we all are impressed about, which is when does this move beyond the, the just copying the training data? that is based on those decisions. So a system like a diffusion model will essentially like, uh, so I think Midjourney uses this system where it will project down the pixel images to a latent space, which is kind of a smaller version, a more compressed version, do some things in that space, and then it can generate images from that. But that decision to compress things down represents a bias that we're putting into the system. So we're saying we want it to be able to reproduce things that can be captured via compression. Any system you have is going to have to make these sorts of trade-offs and decisions. And so what to us seems like, oh, this is something brand magic. new coming, it's magic, it's not. Right? It, it is built on these decisions, these worldviews that are essentially encoded in the decisions we made for the architectures and the training methods. Blake, I, I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on this. Um, I'll hold my thoughts because I'd love to say a few yeah. things too. But. Well, I mean, so the training data that these systems have is analogous to the experiences that a human has had in their life that they've learned from. And the architecture in the neural network is well, directly analogous to the architecture in our neural networks. No one decided what the architecture of their brain would be, and very few people are so privileged that they get to decide what the experiences in their lifetime were. Um, to the degree that you narrowly constrain what the AI is exposed to and narrowly constrain the architecture, sure, it's gonna just reproduce whatever you built it to do. But to speak to the idea of producing jazz, it's actually pretty darn easy to get these generative models to step outside the bounds of their training data by allowing for exploration. And now getting it to do something good that is enjoyable and high quality through this exploration requires feedback. And artists get feedback all the time. They produce new stuff, people cl clap, or people boo. And that evolutionary selection pressure is going on right now as these different models are being put out. The ones that generate images that people like better get more usage and get updated. The ones that produce images that people don't like get discarded. And that is us imprinting our preferences and our biases into the system at a level that we may not be conscious of. Absolutely. We're raising our kids. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so maybe, George, come back a little bit to this notion of the, all the parameters. I mean, there's been this explosion of, I mean, one of the aspects of these models is they have so many more. Like, we went from you know, five years ago, there was a billion parameters in the largest foundation model to close to 200 billion in GPT-3. Who knows what GPT-4 is coming? Now, there's also the papers like the Chinchilla paper that recently came out that would debate the relative value of training your models on parameters alone versus tokens and the tokens and or the embeddings with data. Um, 
talk a little bit about that and then maybe abstract up to the hyperparameters, which is, I think, what you were getting at, and whether the hyperparameters are actually, and these are kind of the, the sort of the meta tuning that you can do when you build these models, and, and how that influences you know, the capabilities of the model and whether those things are actually taught to the model or set for the model or they're derived by the model. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. So I'd like to, rather than get into like nerd space of, of technicalities, let, let's start off with something maybe a little more understandable. So there's the system AlphaGo, which was trained specifically for the game of Go. Right. Uh, there is another system that was released shortly after that, AlphaZero which was presumably not taught the rules of the game. It just observed and was able to learn this. So some students of mine and I, we looked into this, right? And it turns out that, number one, there is actually an encoding uh, that they use within the system that from that it's sufficient to determine whether rules are legal or not, or moves are legal or not. So there is... Uh, potentially a way that it could actually infer rules from, from encodings, but even setting that aside, right, um, you have various decisions that had to be made with this algorithm. And so the title of our paper was uh, Hyperparameter, uh, I'm going to forget the name of my own paper. <laughs> it was uh, Hyperparameter Choice as Search Bias in Alpha Zero. There you go. Um, and so Essentially, all of these tuning knobs that you have, you can have them at the level of the parameters themselves of the system. We now, as machine learning practitioners, we have tr automated training of those parameters. But to do the automated training, you need to often set hyperparameters for kind of how aggressive is the training going to be, et cetera. But even in the architecture decisions themselves, those are all forms of hyperparameter tuning in the sense that you can think of it as a, a, a categorical dial that you're saying, no, I'm not going to use a transformer. I'm going to use a diffusion model. I'm going to use this or that. And all of these things come into play. And the thing that worried me when I began my PhD was that people were kind of blissfully unaware of how much they were inputting of themselves into the system. And then they were ascribing powers to these systems. and that they didn't have, and there's a name for that. It's an ancient name, it's called idolatry. When we, <laughs> when we ascribe powers to objects and systems that do not have that, and it's a dangerous thing, not just for, for spiritual reasons, if you're a spiritual person, but also for pragmatic reasons. I love that. These That's idols great. will let you down. So I think what we're all agreeing on to some level, and I wanna get Robert back in, in on this, is that there are humans in the loop, either explicitly or implicitly, at all the different points for these models. The designing of the models, even if they're relatively unsupervised models, your point about hyperparameters, or when you're trying to build a system that leverages an underlying foundation model, or then you're trying to interpret that data and try to decide, what am I gonna do with this? What am I gonna do with these structure, protein structures? Um, you know, I can tell you that there's a whole ton of companies now in synthetic biology that are leveraging you know, alpha fold to bootstrap the things they're trying to do to figure out, well, what's this, you know, what's the small molecule that might be able to go after that, you know, um, target on one of those proteins to, to stop doing something or start doing something. And, and that's a really clever leverage point. You seem eager to get in, so I'm going to have you jump in on this. Well, I actually think that the focus on the image models um, has obfuscated a couple of places where there essentially aren't humans in the loop. Okay. Uh, the language models that have been deployed as products right now are mostly just free range, responding to whatever positive feedback they get from people. So if you look at a product like Replica, um, Replica definitely does some things that the programmers never intended. And because of the way that they have simply said, make people happy, keep them using the app, oh, and upsell the sexual aspects of our app. There have been some really disturbing stories that I've heard of things that Replica chatbots have said. And the you look at the size of that company, and I've talked to some of them, they, there is no human in the loop. It is all being auto-updated based on what gets more engagement. And... Sure, if you call the utility function of make people use our app more a human in the loop, then okay. But other than that, the humans are providing feedback. And more to my point, the designers who set up the system to have 
that specific objective function and the decisions that were made into how it was going to use and interpret this data. Data doesn't interpret itself. No, they, right? they systems, systems don't that, interpret that themselves. It just didn't happen. So it's just, uh, okay, so I, I don't wanna, um, let me be careful of how I say this. So to the extent that, uh, I wanna be clear on your claim. So are you claiming that this is a system that is an optimization system for specific objectives that was not designed by anyone. Are you asking if a human wrote the utility function? Yes, a human wrote okay. the utility function. Okay. And then they That's stepped sufficient. away. That's no. sufficient. Okay. So a human was in the loop at one point. Okay, Robert, it's been a while. Let you jump in here. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see what I want to say. Um, <laughs> You know, you know, we talked a little bit about the human in the loop. I, I, I also wrote another book, a very short book, called The Case for Killer Robots, Why the U.S. Military Must Continue Developing Artificial Intelligent Weapons. And one of, the, one of the premises is that as much as possible, we have to keep people in the loop. There are cases, however, where things become so complicated that you can't put people in the loop. The military has a term called OODA. It's Observe, Orient, Decide, uh, Act. I believe that's what it is. And this is the decision that you have to go through. I, it reminds me of the old westerns where you have the quick draw and the street, uh, and, and which, whichever gun is fastest is the one that's gonna win in the quick draw thing with, in a showdown. Um, it's kind of like that with military weapons. Now, the question is, is there going to be a case where the UDA is, not, is, is too short that a human can decide. Humans in the loop are going to slow things down. And the answer indeed is yes. Uh, for example, if we're attacked by a thousand drones, you don't have the time for an individual program or AI to point out each drone and take it out. Rather, you have to go to an autonomous mode and you have to take them out in parallel and you have to trust the autonomy. This gets back to an idea. I'm an engineer, electrical engineer, and we have something called design ethics. And one of the problems with these autonomous, uh, autonomous things is that, well, um, you know, if, um, if, uh, if uh, they're, they're autonomous, they might do something that you don't want them to do. So this gets us to something called design ethics, which is to design the AI to do what it was intended to do and no more. This is going to require domain expertise, both in the design of the artificial intelligence and the testing of it. Uh, I just... We just wrote a paper, by, by the way, with Bill Dembski and one of my students, Sam Haug, showing that the complexity of a system grows, the unintended contingencies grow, or the, int the, the contingencies grow, but they grow exponentially. So if, if you double the complexity of a system, the, the contingencies grow by four. If you triple it, it grows by eight. So it, it's just, it becomes unwieldy. So currently, uh, you, um, you must contain the design of the artificial intelligence to be very narrow. And if you look at the success of AI, now this is AI which has been reduced to practice. In other words, it's being used by, um, is being used by the military, being used by private industry, et cetera. You, you see that the big successes are very narrow in the terms of their application. The idea of AGI, or artificial general intelligence, as they begin to climb the little staircase to the moon, and they've gotten to maybe two or three steps, and I, I think the staircase stops and everybody falls off after a while. But um, they, they just, uh, yeah, they, 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 they have a, uh, a little bit but as that, um, as, that com as that complexity increases, we're just not going to be able to test the autonomy of these vehicles, uh, of these weapons, therefore necessitating a, a man in the loop. So I think we're going to have time for a question or two here. I'm going to ask one more, and then we'll come up with our first question from the audience. Um, so let's take an example like facial recognition. You know, I love the fact I can look at my iPhone and it unlocks and it's super easy, and I can look at my iPhone and it can allow me to pay. We've got a long line of folks, so I'm gonna be very short here. But I'm also concerned about the facial recognition surveillance of the Chinese government on all of its citizens. So how do we take friend or foe, as the panel says, in a topic like facial recognition and define the line between when it's friend and when it's foe you know, out of fear that the Chinese could potentially, and I'm not saying they would do this, but say, oh no, it's a, it's a friend because now we're gonna be able to 
target just the bad criminals because we can accurately identify them with the facial recognition. Could I jump in with an alternate explanation? AI is a tool, and just like any tool, you can use it for good or evil. It's simply a tool. And so it's the use of the user that defines whether it's evil or a friend. Yeah, I mean, fire, friend, or foe, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, and you might have... So the question is good because it prompts thinking about how we want exactly. this technology to you know, productively improve our society, but inherently there's no moral value one way or the other. I think yes, I, I largely agree with, with both men here. Um, but to the extent that AI could be used as a force multiplier, I think it opens up more interesting questions. So we could ask a dirty bomb friend or foe, uh -huh. right? It's a tool, but it's a tool that largely is predisposed towards destruction. Yeah, fair enough. Let's have our first question. My name is Steve Trost. I'm with Oklahoma State University. Last year we had uh, Dr. Ray, Jay Richards come to campus talk about the human advantage. <clears throat> I had a question for him uh, that I want to pose to you, and that was, uh, a definition of artificial intelligence that my son and I came up with, which is basically that a machine cannot be considered intelligent until it can be rationally irrational. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is that the machine can look at all of the data and then actually make a decision that goes against what the data would tell it to do and to do that for some rational reason, not just purely uh, randomly. Yeah, if, if I could speak to that. If you look at creativity, creativity is always outside the silo. You look at, for example, the invention of relativity. There was the assumption that there was ether in the space that was necessary for, for light to flow. There was the assumption that the speed of light was relative to... Um, uh, the speed of light was relative to the observer in terms of speed. Einstein took that silo, he went outside of the box, he rejected the dogma, and he came up with relativity. This is a characteristic of true creativity. True crea to, actual creativity cannot exist inside the silo. AI only has the capability of interpolating inside the silo, of interpolating in its training data for, for AI of that sort. And creativity requires thinking outside the silo, and I don't think that it's uh, that, that, that it's possible for AI to uh, think outside the silo unless it's programmed to do so. Let's take another question. There, there's a children's book uh, series called Amelia Bedelia, and the gag in the book is that she takes everything incredibly literally. So if you, she's told to put the lights out, she unscrews the lights and takes them outside. If she's told to, to dust the furniture, she goes get some dirt and put it on the furniture because she needed to be told to undust the furniture. And I used to use this when I was teaching philosophy to explain the, a, a famous quote from Derrida, the French deconstructionist, who said that uh, meaning is context bound and context is infinite. And in the, the thinking of the, the deconstructionists, that was their way of, of, of trying to show that we can't really, that there's no, there's no d definitive meaning for any text. But actually the paradox is that even though you have all these different uh, context dependent definitions of individual words in a string of words, and therefore there could be an infinite number of possible meanings, we're able to perceive the, the genuine meaning when we're communicating with a hearer. There's a combinatorial space of possible meanings, and yet we perceive the correct one. And so I think one of the things that the AI discussion illustrates that we haven't really talked about is what's mysterious about the human mind. I think you three gentlemen have all shown we have a really good understanding of, of, of exactly why AI works. But what we don't have is a good understanding of the way the human mind works, how we're able to, to, to solve those combinatorial search problems in real time and come to d definitive meaning. And I think it underscores something that's a really strong suit of Bob's book and also of Eric Larson's book, who spoke here last year, and that is that there are modes of inference that are easily um, made into, uh, we, the, the, there are modes of in, human inference that can be replicated with algorithms, deduction, induction. But the mode of inference we use most in science and in ordinary life is called abduction, which is underdetermined, and it re requires all this contextual knowledge that's very difficult to uh, to program and to codify. And so, George, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah. So I, I really like this question. Um, 
I think thinking about these systems, like these very impressive generative systems we have now, the question of are these systems kind of steps towards artificial general intelligence? I would say that if sentience and consciousness is simply correlation and not true causation or agency, then yes. But causation is not correlation. And I think that in some of these more sophisticated views of the mind that are not just reductionist computationalist, there's this idea that there is actual agency. And to the extent that we do these things that are, that are very different and very impressive, um, I think that those are intriguing clues to maybe something special about the human mind. And I'll, like, I'll leave you, it at that. You, if we, yeah, go go ahead. I, I would just say, uh, I would probably say Lambda is the only system that does that kind of reasoning right now. And unfortunately, the public doesn't have access to that at the moment. Uh, one of the things that AI has not achieved to a great degree yet is common sense. In fact, the Allen Institute, which uh, our moderator works with, uh, it was founded by Paul Allen, and their primary objective was to give AI common sense. Let me give you some examples of what Steve was talking about and what, what common sense is. These are, these are phrases I collect, which are called flubbed headlines. And the interesting thing about the flubbed headlines is we hear them, one of the interpretations is serious, the other one is funny. And we immediately, without any context, know which one is which. Let me give you a couple. Prostitutes appeal to Pope. Now see, you laughed at the funny interpretation, but you know what the headline meant, didn't you? And you were able to do it without any context, just like, just like Amelia. Um, hospitals sued by seven foot doctors. Okay, were, were these all basketball players that were, were physicians or were they podiatrists? We know immediately from the context which one is serious and which one is not. Um, helicopters powered by human flies. <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we try to get one more question in here? Okay, well, let, 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 me, just, let me just point out. I do believe that uh, artificial intelligence uh, might be able to algorithmically crack these things, but we're appearing a long way from doing that right now to Steve's question. Uh, a similar question to Steve's, but you guys use the word train and observe equally for, excuse me, for people and for machines. Shouldn't it be separate words? I mean, I, I learn through my, uh, my smell, my sense, and you know, an example is, is, is lust. Is a computer going to understand that concept? And you're going to put that, is it going to be male computer? So I think you guys, you guys are leading us to think that the machines are human by using the word train. I, I think you've called us out on something that's a failing on our part, is that even for those of us who are are chiding others for anthropomorphizing, we still tend to use the language of the field, which grew out of these uh, people thinking that we were going to essentially recreate humans within a summer, right? The 1950 Dartmouth conference. And so the language of the AI field itself is built to, to use things like learning, to use things like uh, you know experiencing, which there's probably better words for it. So it's interesting that you use that specific example, though, because the company that I mentioned earlier, Replica, building AI that understands lust is literally their business model. <laughs>